I want to uh, just spend a little bit of time just giving you a brief introduction, and then I want to spend most of our time talking a little bit about the handout that you're getting and uh, the response that I think we need to make as Californians uh, to this issue of the uh, fire fee, uh, which is, as far as I'm concerned, an illegal tax post uh, uh, put mainly on rural Californians and uh, talk through a little bit about that and what the options are and, and what we can do. Uh, first of all, um, I was uh, elected two years ago, two years ago in November, to the Board of Equalization. Uh, the Board of Equalization, as was said, is the only elected tax board in the state of California, or in the nation, excuse me. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting issue in that I believe that the reason why that's important is because it allows Californians to actually have a taxpayer advocate somebody who actually is between them and the bureaucracy when it comes to the issue of tax issues. Uh, somebody who's trying to say, hey, this is about taxpayers, not about how do you feed more money to the government. And so that's what we seek to do. And so every day, um, I like to say that myself and the folks in my office get to advocate for taxpayers. Whether that be an issue that comes up with somebody who uh, uh, has a concern or some issue in regards to some, some audit they just had gotten and they think that something should be done differently, uh, can call us, we can deal with them, help them out through, through that process. Uh, if it's starting a business, whatever it is, we get to be able to help them through that. Now, you're aware, you know, tax, sales tax and use tax is the major issue that the board does. However, there are about 30 some other taxes, special fees, if you will, and taxes, that the board also administers. Uh, most of those are all ministerial, if you will, uh, just like this fire fee we're going to talk to, where the legislature created some kind of a fee, some kind of a tax, and somebody had to do the collection of it. And so as a result of that, oftentimes that, well, in fact, in California, it almost always fell then to the Board of Equalization. And so what we do as a board is we administer those things. And then the other important part that we deal with each, each month, and that is we have hearings. And in those hearings, we deal with appeals. And those appeals can deal with anything from a sales tax. We even do, in, 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 in this state, we do income tax. And so if you have an appeal that you want to go before an elected body for uh, dealing with some dispute you may have with, with, the, with your income tax, you'd come before the Board of Equalization, where you actually get to go in front of elected officials and talk to them about why it is, what your situation is, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing, uh, and why you shouldn't be paying this, or why you think the, the audit was wrong. You get to be able to do that. Um, you know, I, I wish I could say that taxpayers who come before us, the, the, the oftentimes, uh, most of the times, uh, uh, win. Unfortunately, uh, the way the balance of the board is, there are three votes that are not so good for taxpayers and two votes that are. And uh, so oftentimes we end up with these three two splits, but we also get some wins for taxpayers. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, been, it's an important process for us to have and preserve here in the state of California. Uh, like I said, I was elected two years ago. Prior to that, I served in the Senate, and prior to that, I served in the Assembly. Uh, my home is down in Southern California, the southern part of this district. Uh, as was mentioned, the district starts down in kind of the LA, San Bernardino area, and then runs up the eastern side of the state through all the Central Valley, and then up to the Oregon border. And so it's a large district, has about nine million people in it, which each district does, but because we have so much of the rural areas, mountain, desert, uh, it is a, a big land area. Uh, tonight, and I'll be glad to answer any specific questions a little bit later that you may have in regards to the Board of Equalization, how that works, what we do in those things. Also, if you've got any specific issues in regards to tax issues, be, we'd like to talk with you. Now, you may not want to bring up your tax issue in front of everybody, uh, but we certainly have some staff here we can follow up and do constituent work, which we very much feel like is one of our primary responsibilities and what we like to do. Um, but let's, let's talk a little bit about a fire fee. Um, you are going to be, if you live in a state responsibility area, how many of you know that you live in a state responsibility area? How many of you are not sure if you live in a state responsibility area? Yeah. Some of you are going to be surprised that you live in a state responsibility area. And uh, basically a state responsibility area, in California there's about 800,000 people uh, who live in a state responsibility area. In, in its simplest form, 
That is where the state has the first responsibility to respond to a, to a, a fire call. Now, in many of your cases, I don't, in, I don't know if many of your cases, in many cases, people live in a state responsibility area, but then they've also formed their own little fire district. And they tax themselves, if you will, a fee, with a fee, in order for the, this protection that helps them with, then with fire suppression. And uh, some of you, anybody here know that you live in a special fire district? Okay. Um, and so the, you're going to be treated with this, with this particular fire fee a little bit different than the ones who then just live in a state responsibility area. Uh, I'm going to point you oftentimes to this website that we've created called calfirefee.com. On that, you'll find a number of things. First of all, you'll find a map. And you can see if you live actually in a state responsibility area and see if this is going to affect you and if, 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 if it applies to you. Um, that's one of the things. But you're also going to find different ways and suggestions that we have in regards to how do you appeal, if you think the, fair, if you think the bill was not, is, was not right, uh, those kind of issues. There's also directions on that. So a lot of the information in terms of detail you can get there at the um, calfirefee.com. Let me just give you a little bit of background. Um, the legislature, as usual, was looking for some money. Uh, and one of the issues they said is, you know, we got all those folks who live in those areas and, you know, somehow, you know, we send a lot of fire trucks to areas that are in the rural areas and certainly they must be causing those, some of those fires and we ought to figure out a way to get some money from them. So the legislature created this fire fee. You know, I, I don't know if you remember, but a, 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 there was another time before this they tried to do that. Uh, this was Governor Schwarzenegger. He tried to do it through your insurance company. Right? The insurance companies were going to have to collect the money. Well, that didn't work out. And so now they came up with a fire fee. And so the way that the, they said, okay, we're going to create this fire fee. Um, and, and, and first they said, it was kind of interesting because they said, we need to collect an amount of money. And uh, so somewhere, you know, the, somebody said, well, I think we need to collect about $100 million. And so they then decided then, okay, well, let's divide $100 million by how many people we have. And that will be their fee. And so, and then we're going to go ahead, and that's what we're going to budget, and we're going to plan for, and then we're going to let the CAL FIRE board work out exactly how to do it. So they did. And CAL FIRE board came up with a very low fee. It was like $30 or $35 or something. Well, that didn't meet what the governor and the legislature needed. So the governor went back and replaced some of the people on the CAL FIRE board in order to get more people who would vote for a higher fee or tax. And as a result of that, they did. And so now what was then done and put into place by the, by the by Cal, Cal Fire Board was a fee tax of $150 per inhabitable structure. Now, a couple of things you need to remember about what, how that means and, and again what that ha happens. I, I believe, and you'll see from our website, uh, we, uh, we believe that that is an unconstitutional fee because we believe it is actually a tax. They passed it in the legislature with a simple majority vote bill because they could do that if they called it a fee. Now, it doesn't look like a fee. It's that it looks like a tax, and here's why. The fact is, this fee doesn't raise any more money. What this money does that's being used, that's being raised, is basically backfilling Cal Fire for what it is that they're using Cal Fire general fund money for in order to go into the budget. So it's just a way to make more money. The other issue is, just so everybody understands, it's just that this, is a, this is called a fire prevention fee. There is not, you know, it was interesting because somebody said, you know, you're going to go up to Reading, you're going to talk to them about not being in favor of this, 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 this tax, this fee, and you know, and there's a big fire going on up there right now. And I said, this is a perfect place, because I need to tell them that there's nothing in this fee that's going to give them one more fire engine or one more, one more firefighter to help put that out. Nothing. This is going to be a fire pre prevention fee, which basically continues to backfill Cal Fire for 
to make sure that you're doing your proper um, weed control around your property. And prevention issues, you know, reminding you to not start fires. Um, and that's what the money's going to go for. And so one of the things that we, we, and again, one of the issues that we believe why this is a tax is because there's no specific benefit that you get. There's no new benefit. There's only new cost to you. And so what's going to be happening is the bills are going to start going out. The bills go out um, starting in August. August? August 13th, first bills go out. Now, just to tell you, it's interesting. We have kind of, I have kind of a dual role. I have to be, I, I have, I'm, I'm part of the government that has to administer that bill because I'm a member of the Board of Equalization and that's what we do. So one of the things that we did though is we said, hey, this is crazy. You're going to give people a bill and that's going to be due in less than 30 days. Many of these people don't even know that they owe the bill. Many of these people don't even know they live in a state responsibility area. They're going to say, I don't owe this bill. What is this about? So one of the things we were able to do that the, board, that the five members of the Board of Equalization decided, hey, look, we don't want the bill to go out first. We want to at least give them notice that a bill is coming so at least people can be aware and planning to deal with this uh, issue. So it's going to actually be next week um, the notice is going to go out saying that there's a bill going to arrive. So at least there's a little notice going on. Now the other issue is it's going to be done through the state. It's going to be done alphabetical by county for the next two months. And so the first people who will get a bill are going to be like Alpine, uh, Amador, Alameda, and, you know, and then it'll work its way down. Shasta will be toward the end. Uh, and uh, that, and the, so the bills are going to be coming out through a slow process and rolled out. Now the crazy thing I'll hate to tell you about, and that is, you're going to get a bill now, and you're going to get another bill in March. Because the bill you're getting now is for last year. <laughs> well, they, if they could figure out how to bill it, they would. But they or how to charge. And, and, and the bill that you're going to get in March is for this year. So anyhow, that's the way that that particular process is going to work ministerially. And uh, again, we are, our, our goal is twofold. Number one, we want to help inform people. But then we want to show them what, they, what their abilities are. So on the website, you'll see what to do if, for instance, you know, the, you, the record shows that you had three inhabitable structures. Now, what's an inhabitable structure? Well, if you have a house with a trailer in the back, or if you have an apartment over your garage, you could end up with three inhabitable structures. And your bill would be $450, due in 20 days. And another one in March. Uh, and so there's a way, there's an appeals process if you think that somehow that's not right. If you're, for instance, if you get it and, you're, and it's a commercial piece of property, and you've got a bill, you shouldn't get a bill if you're a commercial property. This is only for, the way the legislature did it, only for inhabitable structures. You had domiciles, people who lived there. And so you have, to, you have to then double check to make sure, and there's a process to appeal in that way if you, if you need it. Now the problem is, because of the shortness, you don't have a lot of time. You have, like, you have, like 30, you have less than 30 days to make your appeals. So that's why we want to give this information on this website as soon as possible. Now the other issue is, we want to tell you that you can join with us to help us communicate that this is an unconstitutional tax. Now, what we're waiting for is there's, there's going to be a lawsuit. We're going to be joining that lawsuit. But the problem is they can't create the lawsuit until somebody has been billed, they have paid, and they have appealed and been denied. And that becomes the process then in order for a lawsuit to be called what's called ripe in order to move forward in order to challenge the whole idea as to whether or not this is constitutional or unconstitutional because it didn't take a two-thirds vote. So we anticipate uh, that in, you know, sometime in September, somebody will be, and, and again, there's folks that are already prepped for this, will be paying the bill, will be making the appeal, and then will be denied. Now, we would encourage everybody, uh, even if, you, I mean, at this point, 
if you get the bill and it's and it's and it's and you do have an inhabitable structure and you do live in a state responsibility area, you know, we'd say you better pay the bill. But we'd also say here's what you file along with that your protest in order to demonstrate and one of the protest issues that that we have on there is you believe it's unconstitutional. So that way you're on record, you've made your you made your point clear. Um, and, and uh, you know, you, and, and you, you may not officially join the lawsuit, you don't have to. So other people will be involved in that process. But at least you'll be on record and making clear what it is. So that's what the process is, is with that fire fee. Um, we're, uh, like I said, we're anxious to uh, kind of get through that as soon as possible. We tried to see if there were ways for us to move quicker through it, to, you know, bill somebody up front first so they could get it done before they started billing everybody else. So you had a party that was already harmed and you didn't have to go through all this process, but that wasn't found to be legal. Uh, and so we're working along with the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association in this process with the, with the challenge of it that will be going then to, to court at that point. Um, the other issue we want to make clear, and that is you need to know, and people need to know, who are the legislators who voted for this crazy thing and who didn't? You know, I can tell you, your legislators didn't support this. They understood that this was wrong. And it's important for us to understand, and, 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 and we want to help people be aware of that, that the focus of this, and so we actually have letters to the governor that you can write and other things to just object. Now, you still need to pay it, but we want to make it clear who was, who was we think, on the right side of this decision and who was on the wrong side of this decision. So, uh, but I can tell you, all of your legislators up here were committed to the fact that this was a wrong way to do this, that this is unfair. It's a, to me, it's a tax on rural America. Now, I'll give you what I think it to be the, uh, the, the analogy would be. This would be, for instance, the same to me as if you lived in, uh, down in a high crime area. And somebody said, you know what? You live in a high crime area. Because you live in a high crime area, your area sends a lot more people to prison. And so since you guys send a lot of people to prison from your area, we're going to put a prison fee on you. <laughs> because clearly, your area creates these, these criminals. Just like they say, this area creates these fires. And because you create these criminals, you need to go ahead and pay this fee in order to offset all these other people in California who live in safer neighborhoods. Because it's not fair for them to pay for all these prisons when, when all these peep criminals come from your neighborhoods. And again, the interesting thing is when we talk to people about this, they say, well, you know, these people who live in rural areas, they just, they just should have, they just know and should have known that they're going to go into these areas and they're going to live in these areas and that's where the fires are. So they should just, if, they, if this is unfair to them, then they should just move. If, if you think it's unfair, just move to an area where you, where you don't have that fee. That's kind of, and I said, well, that's fine. It's like, there are a new prison fee, right? If you're in the inner city and you don't like the fact that you're high crime, well, just move. Solve your problem. Well, it's not quite that easy, and I don't envision the legislature coming up very soon with a prison fee. But to me, it's about the same. There's no, dis there's no difference. The fact is that the issue of fire prevention, public safety, is the first priority of government. And so then to go ahead and start deciding that you're going to divide up that first priority by trying to find vulnerable populations that you can go ahead and pass a fee on to is just wrong. And it's really wrong to me when it is that you listen to Cal Fire, and Cal Fire I think is just quite frankly caught in the middle. A lot of great Cal Fire folks, a lot of good firefighters, you all live with them, you know them, they've protected your property. But it's wrong when the administration of the Cal Fire tries to show you a picture of a fire truck or a fireman putting out a fire and saying that's what this tax is for. That is just wrong. Uh, but they know <laughs> if their picture showed a picture somebody writing you a ticket for not clearing your property <laughs> that you probably wouldn't be too motivated to vote for that tax. <laughs> but to show you a helicopter dropping water on a fire, well that's motivating. Unfortunately it's just not true. So that's kind of what our background is for, for that. Um, we want to just leave as much time as possible for questions. Uh, and so I'm going to be here, and we've got folks at Mike's. If you can ask the question, and it doesn't need to be about the fire fee. It can be broader in general. Um, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll, I'll be, if I can't answer it, 
I've got, we have people here who can. Uh, or, or we can find out and get back to you. But one way or another, we'll, we will try to find the answers to those. But uh, let's just take a moment right now to answer questions. Hi, thank you for coming and helping us out. If I have raw land with no structures, do I still pay a fee? No. No, if you have raw land with no structures, it's not inhabitable. There's, it's, it's only the inhabitable structure that actually targets the fee. What happens to me if I don't pay it? If I do have a structure on my land? And it's inhabitable. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a barn, I suppose, unless there's a bunkhouse on the barn or something. Uh, basically, if you don't pay it, you have 30 days from the date of the bill to pay it. That means, you know, if you get, you know, you go to your mailbox and all of a sudden it's been in the mail for the last week, you know, that means you've got 20 days to pay it. If you don't pay it, there is basically a penalty and interest. Uh, eventually, eventually, they will try to figure out a way to do a collection on you. Now, this, this is not a direct property tax, so they can't necessarily then just add it onto your property tax. But there will be a collection process that will end up being problematic. And so that's why we just tell people, you know, fight as you want to the fee, but don't get caught up with not paying it. Because that's just not, that's not going to solve your problem and it's only going to potentially make your problem bigger. So just let's fight it and let's get it rid of it, but let's go ahead and go down that route. Okay, yes. Um, two questions. Uh, number one, is it true that there have been 57 positions created within the Board of Equalization to handle this new fee? And if the lawsuit results in eliminating this fee, what will happen to those jobs? And number two, what are the chances that this $150 will magically increase over time? <laughs> well, to the, to the question, yes. There, I, I don't know. I'm trying to remember what the what it was exactly, but yes, there were numbers of positions added um, to the Board of Equalization for the activity, the ministerial function of collecting the fee. Um, if the fee goes away, um, it's an interesting question. You know, it's very interesting to me at times when it is that things have changed and the, the positions still hang around. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, it, I, I don't know. We're probably... We, it takes us a while to hire those folks, and so quite frankly, I think we would, if it went to court and began to get challenged in court, we would just turn off the hiring. Um, CAL FIRE also has done a number of hirings for this issue, so it's not just the Board of Equalization. CAL FIRE has also then, um, CAL FIRE has um, contracted out some of the work. Uh, when, you first, when you get this and there's a phone number for CAL FIRE and you call it, it's actually not the state of California you're calling, it's actually a contractor that, that, is being, that, that you'll be talking to. Uh, so anyhow, so yes, the, 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 the goal would be to cut it off and then we'll figure out what to do with the positions, but you're right, that's, that would have to be dealt with. Yes? All right, I've uh, got a question about what they consider a habitable structure because uh, when this first come about I have two sheds now they do not have permanent wiring to them and county says as long as it's not permanently wired it's not habitable but also they say it could be because it does have electric to it has no windows in it or anything, but it could be considered a habitable structure. The, the problem it's, is going to be is that we got, a, the, basically the BOE who's doing the billing got their information from the county assessors. And so it depends on how your county assessors look at your property. Now that's why the county assessors really have some difficulties with this particular law too. Because they never were in the business of necessarily determining what is a habitable structure and what isn't. But it's kind of put them in the middle. So I would suggest that if all of a sudden anybody gets a bill that's more than one, or if they feel like, you know, because somebody said, yeah, you've got a shed over there, you've got, you know, uh, you know the, you've got a garage, but somebody has decided that, that garage somebody could actually live in if they wanted to. 
Um, that's, there's, a, there's actually, on our website, there's, a, there's some paperwork for your appeal on that basis. Because uh, I imagine there's going to be a number of disputes that are going to be created in regards to that issue. Okay, I got one more question uh -huh. for you, if you don't mind. No. Uh, BNC, I know quite a few people through CAL FIRE. CAL FIRE really does not fight fires, okay? They may lay hose, they may bring engines, they may clear areas. But once they clear them and they do anything they have to do within that area, they set back fires to take over the burn back to what's burning this way, even though you've cleared this area. They don't really fight fires, believe me. They may bomb them with water and do things, but the ground people, they don't do that. And a lot of times they don't even use hoses out there. Uh, they don't have water running through them. They just... Yeah, they use a lot of different techniques to suppress. Yeah, yeah right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reading your flyer here, and uh, I think it's about time to get out the American flag and run it upside down up the flagpole, because we're, uh, we're hurting. Um, what, what I want to talk about here is the money is going to CAL FIRE. Yes. It's going to be raised from this. Yes. Well, I'll be darned. And then it also down at the bottom of your flyer here says all appeals will be handled by CAL FIRE. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, folks, we've, uh, you know, they're, they're coming after, they're coming after the, uh, the clips on our, on our long rifles. They're coming after us for, for, uh, for uh, this fire fee. Yep. And the very department that's going to get the money is the one that we have to apply right. the appeal to. Yep. And they're, right. Yeah. So I... Right. We, Which is actually one of the issues that we tried in the legislation to do was to at least make the appeals come to the Board of Equalization. Or it should be. Uh, but they didn't do it. Because uh, that way you do have a fair... You know, you have somebody who isn't getting the money. And when we... You know, we're looking at issues. It's not, there's not money coming into our programs. Uh, and but they wouldn't they wouldn't go for that. Well, the California legislature just recently allowed the Department of Fish and Game to devise strategies to fund themselves. Now Cal Fires they're devising a strategy to fund themselves. Yep. You know, folks, we got it. it. It's about time that we start electing the right kind of people to the legislature to turn this state around. Well, and thank you. And and I think one of the issues that I think was asked earlier is that what's the what's the what's the what's the uh, um, likelihood of this fee to go up, it's a hundred percent likelihood. Not only is it going to go up, but it's going to be expanded. I mean, right now, commercial is in it, but commercial will be in it. Uh, you know, it just that's just the nature. Yeah, George, just to clarify, the previous gentleman on um, a habit, uh, habitable yes. structure. The Board of Forestry uses uh, a habitable structure main or. Uh, yeah, they call it a habitable structure maintained for human habitation. And we just had a thing where it had no water cooked to it, no electric cooked to it. Oh, I mean, you just have to prove. That's part of your appeal process. Right. That, that it's not maintained for human habitation. Now, the question I had for you is I wanted to clarify what you said earlier. So if you decide not to pay the fee, you have a website that says something about you can write unconstitutional or something? No, I said, no, I didn't say if you decide not to pay it. I'd say it's, uh, I said pay it. <laughs> And then go ahead and make your protest and file that for a refund. Okay. Yeah, because I. You, but, but you I, mentioned a website. Yes, the website is Cal Fire. That's our website. Okay, calfirefee.com. Cal, calfirefee.com is our website. Okay. That'll, and that'll give you direction. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, the lady who spoke first made a comment that uh, pertains to houses versus unoccupied land. We live up in Shingletown and I see more unoccupied land uh, very far ready versus houses which are trimmed up. There's more of a risk for uninhabited land. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, why put the fee on Ab homeowners? Hey, uh, many of the fires that we fight, the Cal Fire fights, or that, other, that, that people are involved with, with, with firefighting, are not are, are not threatening the structures. Yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot of land in California. Yeah, um, that we that we suppress fire in that are not there's not an inhabitable structure around. 
So to then say what we need is these people who happen to live in these SRAs to pay the bill to fight the fires over there doesn't make any sense. And of course, bottom line is this doesn't pay to fight fires anyhow. Okay. Uh, another question. This seems to me like it's a bullying tactic. Uh, this is an illegal, I think, uh, bill. It's going to be fought with Howard, Jar mm -hmm. Howard Jarvis. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully they'll prevail. But it seems like the politicians are saying, well, let's do anything we can. And if they fight back, we'll go ahead and say, oh, well, we were wrong. And this just costs more money in the long run for attorneys and everything else. It's disastrous. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree. Okay. I agree. You know, I, I mean, this is, this is basically an attempt to find money wherever you can find money. Now, another question. This mm -hmm. is the last one. Um, up in Shingletown, there's a little community church, and they have a yard sale every year. Uh -huh. This year, when they applied for the permit, they were told, oh, you have to collect sales tax on yard sales. Now, mm -hmm. they later said, oh, if you have three or more per year, then you have to collect sales tax. But isn't this getting ridiculous? We're trying to sell our junk, and you, you, want, taxes, you, you want blood out of a turnip. Right. Yeah, there, 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 there is a, uh, <clears throat> a guideline that's used for incidental sales and then and trying to move it away from, you know, a regular sale, ongoing sale. And so oftentimes people get bad advice, uh, you know, and say, hey, I'm going to have a yard sale or we're going to have this special sale. And somebody, oh, yeah, don't forget your permit. Well, no, you don't need a permit for that. And so, but, but again, if all of a sudden you're having a regular sale every Saturday, that's a different kind of event than having, you know, an event, there, you know, a yard sale or a, a community sale every once in a while. So, but yeah, that's the kind of stuff that we will, if somebody has an issue like that, that's the kind of constituent work that we can help with to help clarify that when people get bad advice. Yeah. All right. So the, uh, my wife, Frances, and I live in the city limits. In fact, we live about a half a mile from the fire department across the street. So I don't think we're affected by this. So I'm going to change the no. subject. Uh, I'm not saying that I do this, but probably a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people in this room probably... You've heard of people do this. A lot of, <laughs> most of the people in this room probably order stuff over the phone or, or by the internet out of state and don't pay taxes. Now, are we supposed to, legally, we're supposed to write a check to the Board of Equalization on that, aren't we? The California is like all states. They have a sales tax and they have a use tax. Um, when you buy something from out of state, mm -hmm. the law says yeah. that you're required then to pay the equivalent of the sales tax to the state of California as a use tax. Now, unless you paid it to the state that you bought it from. So like, let's say you bought it, I don't know, let's use this for an example. Let's say you bought it from, uh, I'll pick a state, um, Oregon. Well, no, Oregon's a bad choice. Uh, New York. <laughs> Uh, New York, um, and you paid 8% sales tax to the state of New York, then you don't have to pay the tax then to the state of California. Can you get a refund for the difference? Well, you mean if it's more, there, you mean if you paid more? No, you can't get a refund if you paid more because you paid it to the state. But if you order something on the internet and they did not charge you a sales tax, now, they should have charged you a sales tax if they have what's called nexus in the state of California. You probably read last year a little bit about what went on with Amazon, right? Amazon didn't, isn't, didn't, and is still not, but will be charging sales tax to California residents starting in no, September. Um, because they said, I don't have nexus. We don't have a brick and mortar business. We don't have full-time salespeople. So, so there was a bill passed by the legislature last year, which I opposed, which broadened the issue of nexus in the state of California, which meant that a lot more companies who you buy from the internet are going to be forced to collect California sales tax. Amazon chose to go ahead and just create nexus. So they're building distribution centers in the state of California. One in Southern California right now, one in Northern California. That's going to require them by law to have to collect the tax when you order. Now, let's say you buy from, um, let's pick another one. Um, overstock. 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 
Overstock does not have nexus. And even under the new law, they're not going to have nexus. But if you order from them under the law, you are owing a, um, a use tax. On your, on your tax forms, there's a place for it. It says, you know, blah, 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 did you buy something, you know, out of state that you didn't buy, pay sales tax on? And then they ask you in your tax form to put a number in there. Now, the FTB is uh, going to make it even easier for you next year because they're going to have a little chart for you. And they're going to say, if you don't remember what you bought out of state, then you just tell us how much money you make and we'll tell you what you probably owe us. <laughs> Um, I guess you can use the chart if you'd like, um, but that's what they're going to do. So the answer to that is yes, and, there, well, and every state is like that, I guess, unless you live in a no-tax state like Oregon. Uh, every state has a use tax, um, and the reason why is historic, it's, it's just historically it went into place back in the, back in the, early, in the early 30s when sales tax started going into effect in big cities, and if you lived in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia had, and, and Pennsylvania had a sales tax, and you found out that New Jersey doesn't, you'd go across the bridge and buy your stuff in New Jersey, and so then all of a sudden somebody said, hey, look, we better come up with another tax to catch those people, and that's what happened. Well, if I order something out of state and there's no tax, I'll pay to, to this board legalization unless I forget. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, several years ago, you had a stop voter fraud yes. initiative that yes. you attempted to get on the ballot. Yes. Um, could you kind of tell us what happened to that and what it, what can we do to possibly try to get that on? You know, 2014. Yeah. I we yeah we try, we had a uh, we've I've done a number of ballot issues. My wife and I, Sharon, who's actually a state senator now, um, and one of them we did we did. Um, Jessica's law and did that through initiative because we couldn't get it through the legislature. Um, we tried to do one on voter fraud. Um, and we had it done, we were out, you know, we, we had legally got it done, got its title and summary, it was actually, it not only did voter fraud in terms of showing ID, but it also gave the extra days, which is actually one of the issues being challenged in another state right now, extra time for overseas military personnel to get ballots in. Um, but the reality is, we, it takes about a million and a half dollars to qualify. Yeah. And we just, we, we couldn't find the million and a half dollars. Uh, in this state, it's just, you cannot qualify an initiative with volunteer work. The state's too big and the time frame's too small. And so you really have to have the million dollars, million and a half dollars to do it. So um, we're still interested. We still have the language. If we have some buddy who says, I'm with you on this, let's make this work, we're there for them, and we'd be glad, to, we don't have any pride of ownership, we'd be, give the whole thing to them. Uh, but at this point, that's where we are right now. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so I had a question. When will, what are they going to stop taxing the death out of us? The federal <laughs> government's broke, the state broke, the county's broke, the city's broke, and all they're doing is they're putting out these special committees and hiring people that we don't need, they're useless, and um, how much more can we take? Well, uh, we got the, uh, I go Doug Lamalfa one time, I says, um, this, under Obama, we spent $5.7 <coughs> trillion, dollars, and it's gonna be $6 trillion. Dollars. We got nothing for it. We have no boa train, we don't fix the bridges, we don't do nothing. All this stuff is just a waste, and you're gonna, business is moving out of California, you're taxing the debt, they're going to Georgia, they're going to Texas, and they're going to China. And, uh, you, and they hired about um, the, the Republican president. He's, he got most of his money out of the country. Those businesses, money he got invested, they would die in this country. What would Apple be today? It wouldn't be almost a half a trillion dollar company. It would, it would falter. And uh, these companies have to move out of the country, and they're going to move out of the state. And look how many businesses they're losing in them. Reading and all that. Yeah. And if you start taxing the people to death, but they can't pay their taxes, they don't have any trouble, you know, right over their land use, we're going to have a civil yeah. war. Well, that's, that's why coming. that's why we need to then, when, when, a, when a fee or a tax is done like this fire fee, illegally, we need to fight it. 
The other thing we need to do is, I mean, there's going to be uh, a couple of ballot issues coming up this fall. It, don't give any more money to Sacramento. And who can who? Peer, just don't. One more second, one second. You know, it's, it's the only way you're really going to have to deal with it is you're going to have to just cut them off. I just want to ask them. I have one question to ask. Okay. I heard they had 150 people in this city are collecting pensions, over counting everything benefits, over $200,000. Yeah. And the other guys are only making ten dollars. You can't tax the people to death. No, no, and that's and, the, and you know it's interesting. I, you know, again, the part of our problem is we're seeing all these attempts to do things, but at the end of the day, um, what we see is the legislature and the governor are much more active in trying to find out how to get more money from Californians rather than trying to find some, you know, sensible reform to pension issues, trying to figure out how to do better, better, more efficient government. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we need to be doing. And the problem is if we if we, um, and, and a perfect just, example, just I guess, is what we've just read, you know, in regards to the whole issue of the, the state parks money, right? You know, they're going around closing state parks when they have $50 million sitting in a bank account somewhere. Um, because they know they can make you feel bad and give, feel like maybe you have to give, give more money to the government if they're going to close your local park down the street. And we just need to call their bluff. Don't give them any more money. Let them figure it out. Uh, back to the fire issue. Yeah. If your home catches on fire, you haven't paid the fee, will they let your house burn? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to get people to pay the fee. Put that what, word out. What they'll do is they'll give you a little sticker for your window, right? <laughs> kind of like, like your registration for your car. <laughs> no, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, hopefully that's not the case, but I don't, I don't know. That will not be the case. Okay, just one. Yes. Um, I would like to some, have some collaboration of some information that I have um, gotten in trying to research this thing. It, actually, it's a, kind of a series of statements, but the first one is I was very involved with the Neighborhood Watch, and I was a fire prevention coordinator for that. I already know that CAL FIRE has an enormous amount of educational information for communities, handouts and so forth right. that we used. Um, we were very active in everyone doing, you know, defensible space. Which leads me to, we lived through the fire of 08. If people think that CAL FIRE is going to defend them, they are mistaken. We watched a lightning strike hit up in, off the grid above us on the hill. We watched that fire grow for 10 days. When it finally hit us, we were looking at a 300-foot wall of fire and the fire trucks running down the road saying, get the hell out. Mm -hmm. We were left to defend ourselves. I went to the um, Board of Forestry meeting at the supervisor's meeting. It was my understanding that the money generated from this fire fee, not a penny, will come back to anyone for five years. This is what we were told. And, who, and who said that? The Board of Forestry. And most of that money will go to the grant system for the people that make a living off of defensible space. A lot of the money can go to grants. It, it was made aware to us that most of it will be. Those people will be standing in line for that money. So sometimes I think in government entities, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, and that's how people maneuver. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to share that information because I have gotten it firsthand, and also I have been attending these meetings. Okay. So is this all correct? Well, I, 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 I don't believe that the issue of the five years is true. Because we've got to remember what the, most of this money is for. Most of this money is to backfill things that they're already doing. Well, I understand that. So, so, so. But we were told that for the first five years it will go only to administrative costs, and no money will be returned to Cal Fire. That's no, what we were told no, that, that, that would not be correct because they, what happens is the state needs that money that they took from CAL FIRE for their general fund. To fund CAL FIRE? No, and, and so how their, CAL FIRE is going to be reimbursed for the administrative things that they do, defensible space, space grants, is going to come from that fee. But so the back fee fills that. It's duplicating a program that they already have. It's not duplicating, it's, it's funding the program that they already have. So they took the money away for the program, and now they're giving it back through this. Fee. Through the fees, correct. Okay. That's exactly it. All right, thank you. Yes. 
Uh, yes. Uh, am I on? I'm short. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, I'm. I guess I, I don't understand what the Equalization Board uh, is. I'm, I'm from Nevada and I lived in Massachusetts most of my life, although I was born here. I don't understand how, it does, do you have a certain amount? Do they come from all over the state? There are, there are four members that are elected by districts that are, serve on the Board of Equalization. A uh, fifth member who serves on the board is the state controller. So yeah, and we have districts. Each so district how could they has appoint? about nine million people. So how could they? Uh huh. Each district has about nine million people. No. So how? Why did there end up being enough to get something passed? Uh, you said the that board, they hired more people uh, uh, so that they could get it. I guess I just don't okay, understand. Okay, remember what the board does is respond. The board has to do what the legislature tells it to do. So when the legislature passed the fire fee, they said we're going to have the board of equalization do the billing and the collection. So the so the legislature then says we're going to give the board of equalization X amount of millions of dollars to collect the fire fee. So that's how the board gets the money in order to collect the fee that the legislature passed. All right. So the equalization board, you said something about you determine what taxes were going to be or uh, the... No, what the Just board does... All no. you do is collect? No, well, we... <laughs> That's a big part of what the board does, sure. Well, if this Let is the just, only state that does it... No, no, no. Uh, Remember what other states... Every, uh, every state collects taxes, no, right? No, no, no. I said you, this is the only state that has an equalization board. Has an elected board. Right. Every other, most other, in fact, all other states have what they call a Department of Revenue. Right. And a Department of Revenue are basically all bureaucrats, like the IRS, and they basically then collect tax. If you have a dispute in a, in a, in a, in like you think you paid too much or you think you don't owe the tax, if you live in a state with the Department of Revenue, you go to a tax court, most likely, or you appeal through the bureaucracy in order to try to get your money back or whatever it is. Or you have to go to court to do it, hire an attorney, do that. In California, if you have a dispute, you get to go before an elected board. You don't, it doesn't cost you anything. Is the elected board in a district? In a, would you have to go down? Like we, you said, we meet, you we meet, we meet. Our board meets twice or once a month. Um, every third month is in the, is in L.A. The rest of the months we meet in Sacramento, and we have two, three, four days of hearings of people who come up with tax disputes, and these can be anything from. A multi tens of hundreds of millions of dollar dispute with AT and T to somebody who um, has who who the board of equalization said you 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 owe use tax on your motorhome that you just bought and they don't think they do and they both uh, both the entities come before us and we act then on the information that we're given to determine whether or not that tax is due or what, what relief should be done. So it, when we get our notices or our bills for a hundred and some dollars, yes. we individually have to take our lawyer and go to either Sacramento or... No. So that's no. what I'm... Okay, here, let me, let me, let me go th specifically with the fire fee, as, I, as we said, the, the BOE is not doing the appeals. I wish we were. Oh. But those are handled by CAL FIRE. So you've got to do, that is an administrative bureaucratic process. Good luck. Um, I think the best method that people need to deal with is just pay your bill and protest. Be on record that you think it's wrong and unconstitutional. And let's go fight the fight. All right, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, I have a question, not regarding the fire, but something I've always wondered about. Okay. My husband and I had a tire shop. Uh -huh. We sold new tires. Uh, I had to charge for the new tire 
plus FET, which is federal excise tax, which I was told was only supposed to be a temporary tax during the war, during the Second World War. <laughs> which, which war? Okay. <laughs> so my question is, I had to charge for the new tire, also for FET tax, and then a tax on the total amount. Now that's tax on tax. A tax. Why? Uh, California, unfortunately, has a number of issues. When you, so, you talk about a sales tax on top of the... Right. Um, the tax. California has a number of unique issues that are, I think, very unfortunate. And quite frankly, would be in control of the board. If I could get one more conservative member on the board, we could stop tax on taxes. Uh -huh. But it takes three of us. Um, I'll give you another one we could stop. How many of you have bought a cell phone and you bought a cell phone for $15 and then you looked at your receipt and you just paid sales tax on $150? Right. That is a board regulation that if we had one more vote, we could stop. Uh, because you know, a lot of times we, we say that the board doesn't have the ability to create tax. Well, in a way we do. Because we could determine taxable issues like that. Uh, and tax on tax, we could, we could create a policy which would say sales tax could not be on items that are already... Gasoline is an example, yeah. right? Right now, right now you pay tax on the tax for gasoline. Right, right. Yeah. I um, argued with state board for so, I don't know how long. So unfortunately... <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the way it is by regulation, not by statute. And if we had another vote on the, on, the, on, the, on the board, I mean, if you could give me, let's see, what you guys can help me with is a Republican, or I should say conservative, a conservative state controller. Because if we could get a conservative state controller, that would give us three conservatives on the board. Because uh, you can't vote for the other board members, they live in LA and San Francisco. But you can vote for a state controller. And if we could get a conservative state controller, we could actually roll back a number of taxes in that way. Yeah. Okay, I got two questions. Yes. <laughs> One is, uh, I was told, you're aware of the $25 fee, corporate annual filing for a, a statement of stock? And if you miss the filing date on that, it escalates to $250. And uh, it's uh, one of my absolute pet peeves. And I was told that I can only uh, uh, appeal that to the Secretary of State's office. Are you aware of that? We've run into this issue. We've had this issue before our office at times, right? Haven't we? This sounds real familiar. We, here, the problem we have with the BOE right now is that neither of those issues are related to us. I mean, we, we get FTB when it comes to appeals. But when you're actually dealing with FT, FTB, we can deal with tax issues with them, but it's kind of like we don't have, they're not, my, they're not my program. Yeah, because you can only appeal it to the Secretary of State and then the FTB collects it. So that's a problem because you can't get these guys to stop while you're doing the appeal, yeah. which is garbage. You yeah. know? And all, I, if, you're, if it's, again, if, if you get, do you have a specific, did you have a specific issue with something that you did or something? Oh yeah. Well, why don't you let us know? I will. Because we can, we can on, a, on a specific issue, let us see what we can do. Okay. At that, it's just not. It's not just in our main wheelhouse. That's okay, our good. Problem. Well, that was short and sweet. But th this is uh, the next one. Is the one I really wanted to <laughs> run by you here. <clears throat> this is from the Revenue and Taxation Code section 7080-7099.1, which you should be familiar Jim, with. Jim, are you listening to that? <laughs> That's, That's why I brought Jim. He knows all that stuff. This is the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights. Okay. 7081. The legislature, I, don't know, I want to read this. The legislature finds and declares that the taxes are the most sensitive point of contact between citizens and their government, and that there is a delicate balance between revenue collection and freedom from government oppression. It is the intent of the legislature to place guarantees in California law to ensure that the rights, pro privacy, and property of California taxpayers are adequately protected during the process of assessment and collection of taxes. Now my question is, have we crossed over into oppression yet? I, I, um, you, you, you will not believe the number of times when we deal with the bureaucracy and we bring up the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. That's one of our main issues in regards to treatment of taxpayers. That's why it is that we, for instance, uh, dealt with the issue of notification. We deal with the issue of, uh, 
uh, of a number of issues, when, and we oftentimes go back to the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. We go to our legal people and say, is this a violation? We have, in this, in, 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 and he does a good job, um, a taxpayer rights advocate within the BOE. And we work very hard to make sure he is staffed and deals with the issues the best he can in order to deal with well, it. But I, I, no, I, I think that the, we... Well, it seems to be they're circumventing their own law. And when they start not following their own law, because if they're saying that, it's, if you're saying this is an unconstitutional tax, and they're not trying to protect our property rights and our privacy, and they're oppressing us with this tax illegally, then, you know, I'm... Well, they, they don't believe it's an illegal tax. Okay. You know, I mean, I mean, they, I mean, I mean I, that's... They don't believe it is. Well, what constitutes an illegal tax, then? Well, I believe this does. Yeah. <laughs> I rest yeah. my case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is not taxed? What is not taxed? Right. Everything is taxed in one fashion or another. How about, well, like groceries, are they taxed? Um... <laughs> Things of that nature. What, what kind oh, of? Oh, you mean you mean you mean you mean what is a taxable, tangible item? What isn't? Yeah. It's a okay. It's a, it's. It can't be very. You mean for say you're talking about sales tax? Yes. For, um, for it is a California is a very complicated process for what is taxed and what isn't taxed. It gets incredibly complex when you start talking about food, and hot food, cold food, food taken out, food eat, 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 taken eat, eaten in. Uh, it gets really complicated. So. Generally speaking, groceries aren't taxed. Generally speaking. Now, in California. Okay. But that's it? That, that, that's the only thing that's not sales no, tax? No, there's other sales tax. Uh, uh, prescription drugs aren't sales taxed. Uh, services aren't, uh, well, there's no tax on services. Prescription drugs aren't taxed. Okay. They, they aren't, don't have a sales tax. Okay, my next question then um, was, I. I'm still working in uh, business, mm -hmm. and I'm a, often I'm a subcontractor to a general contractor, and I tax, they want me to pay the sales tax on my material. Mm -hmm. So I pay, the mater I pay the sales tax, and I quote my job is... Do you pay it to them, and then they pay it? No, I, I collect it from them, and then I pay it when okay. I pay the taxes for our company. From time to time, I become the general manager, and I'm hiring subcontractors, and I ask them to pay the sales tax. Uh -huh. So then, at that point, when I sell their product that has been taxed already by them, right? Can I? Do I have to pay sales tax on that? No. Okay. No, it's only taxed one, 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 one time. Now, okay. it's see, it gets sticky if you did you did you sell it for more than you bought it for? Yes. Jim, what's the process if they, there's a, isn't there a, pro, isn't there an, an ability to, if, so, if somebody, I'm sorry, go ahead. You can claim a tax paid purchase is resold credit if you paid tax on something and then turn around and the next person who sells it and collects the tax. I wonder if he sold it for more. We're going to mark that up. Well, you still get the credit for the tax. You get you the pay. credit, but you have to pay so, the difference. Exactly. Yes, you have to pay the difference. Yeah, you get the credit for what you paid, and then you're going to have to pay the difference. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah, hello. Um, I have a, a statement more than a question. Someone earlier talked about the pension from the firefighters and, and so forth. Uh, I'm a, a certified financial planner and investment advisor. And I think people need to wake up and pay attention. I appreciate everyone in here that's paying attention to politics because the pension situation is going to be a lot worse because so many people are not aware that right now the assumptions that they're making on the rate of return that the pensions will make for CalPERS and so forth is in the 9 to 11 percent range. Right. And they haven't made that for a long time. And it's very unlikely that they're going to make that. So all of the tax issues that we're discussing today and all the taxes that the states are trying to raise is only going to get worse and worse and worse when they start realizing that they're only making 4 and 5 and 6 percent. Yep. And the amount of money that they're going to have to fund to fund these pensions is going to be huge. And as much, you know, I, whoa, I have a lot of respect for first responders and firefighters and all of that as well. But... 
the, the simple reality is, is a lot of them are making six figures and with overtime and so forth, $200,000. And then I counsel many, many, many county client workers and so forth. And if they work there long enough, they end up you know, with 90% of their retired pay. The last three years that they max out their overtime and so forth so that they're retiring with 100% of, the, of their right. pay. And the sad thing is you don't see the legislature actually acting no, to do and, anything. And even the people, well, we don't want to cut the firefighters and we don't want to cut this. Uh, I've read today that in Illinois that they're paying more on pensions than they are in education. They had a tax increase in Illinois last year. 100% of it went to the pension problem. That's right. And, and so the, the simple fact is when the, the average person is making 40 and 50 grand, that you want to not have so much sympathy for even the firefighters, God bless their soul. But maybe we ought to open up the, the employment apps to the general population they would be happy to work for 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 grand instead of 80 or 90 or 100. Uh, and then when we end up having to fund those pensions, we're going to... Well, and what you're finding, and I think, I, I think the good sign is, I, don't, I, I guess I don't know specifically up here in, in Redding or in, in Shasta County specifically, but what you are seeing is in San Jose, San Diego, voter-initiated pension reform issues in those cities. So... You are seeing it happen. It's going to. It's taking too long, and it's probably. You know, hopefully, it's not going to be too late. But you are seeing those issues. Yeah. But I mean, you see, was, an, you see a legislature that's so arrogant. There was even talk about overturning what those local cities did. Uh, Wisconsin, for for example. And then just one final note. Someone mentioned closing the the state parks pet peeve of mine again because I see the seniors who need help, me need help, etc. But what sense does it make to keep paying unemployment for two years, welfare to everything that, that doesn't move, and then <laughs> close the state parks? You know, we, we need to tell Americans you've got to work well, to make a living. Government, government will always, government will always, they're not going to tell you, they're going to tell you you need to pay higher taxes for things that you think you really want. So they're going to talk about how it is, for instance, that if you don't pass this, these tax deals in, 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 uh, you know, in, uh, in November, that we're going to have to cut the school year by 14 days. What they don't tell you is in this year's budget, they actually created a whole new year of school called transitional kindergarten. So at the same time, they're telling you, oh, by the way, we're going to have to cut the school year by 40, for 14 days. But they're still going ahead and starting a whole other year of school. And because they know that you're not going to vote for a tax increase to start another year of school, but you may vote for a tax, year if you, a tax increase if you feel like the schools are going to be shorted. And that's what they do. And so the same thing with parks. They try to get you to pay more on tax because they think you'll want, you don't want parks to close. They want you to pay more money for, for tax because you want to keep your community safe, because you want your fires put out. They don't give you a choice as to whether or not you want to shorten unemployment to, to 18 months, or don't give you a choice as to whether or not you want other kinds of welfare reform. They don't give you those choices, or pension reform. They just give you reforms, or they just give you ideas that you're going to have to go without if you don't do the tax increase. Yeah. Oops. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I th really think we should stay on, on the subject. Another thing, if I pay this bill, and it's going to cost me $300. Yeah. All right? So we collect all, all this money, right? Millions of dollars. They take that, calculate, take that money and put it into a grant, you'll never get it back. You'll never get that money back. You mean, you mean if you if, pay it and... If I pay it and, and Cal and, and Grant they, collects and, all this money... And they and, lose the court case? It, and put it in a grant, you won't get it back. If they lose the court case, you will get the money back. Well, I don't believe it. I'm sorry. Well, That's my opinion. By law, you have to. There's things that you can't... Right. The state can and can't do some things. What you right. can't do is if something is declared unconstitutional, they can't then not refund that money. All right. So, 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, earlier, a comment was made, tongue in cheek, sort of. You need a permit on your house so they will put out the fire in case it catches on fire. In approximately 1979, between 77 and 80, but I think 79, I lived in Shingle Springs. Uh -huh. We had a new builder. We had up there our fire department district and CDF, or whatever name it went to back then. Mm -hmm. A individual was building a home up on a hill in CDF zone. Our fire chief went out to him and said, hey, come into the district. Our fees aren't high. Pay our dues. And the guy said, no, if there's a fire, you'll come put it out. I was on a fire truck driving up the road to this far up in the mountain. We could see the flames, and halfway there, it turned out, the fire chief found out it was the guy's house. We were turned around because he was not in our district. You cannot uh, fight, uh, you know, you, you have to be concerned with workman's comp. You can't go outside your district and still be covered. We went back to the fire station and watched the structure burn down before CDF responded. The laws may, may have been changed by now, but it has happened. Yeah, I, again, I, I, I don't doubt it. That's why it is that most places have mutual aid agreements to try to prevent that kind of stuff, but I don't doubt that those are real stories out there like that. Yes? Not yet. How about now? now there yes. we go. The legislature got a budget put together based on a tax increase that Mr. Brown figures he's going to get, but right. he's not going to get it. Right. What's going to happen? Um, what they did is they put into place certain triggers. And they said, uh, if we don't get this money, we're going to create, we're going to have these triggers. One of which the triggers, one of the triggers was, I think, 14 days less in the school year. And there were various other triggers. And so that's what they say is going to take place. Now, I don't believe that's the case. Last year, they passed a budget with triggers in it. Last year, remember, it wasn't, they weren't going to, they didn't get the money from a tax increase last year. What they did is they balanced the budget on about, I think about $4 billion of money that they said the federal government was going to give them. And then they said, if the revenues don't come in, then we're going to go ahead and pull triggers in order to lower the, to lower the expenses of the state. Didn't happen. I think only about one third of the triggers were pulled, which meant the ongoing spending that wasn't funded continued. This is where the public unfortunately was duped when it is that they said, oh, let's go ahead and vote for that simple majority vote budget where legislators don't get paid if they don't pass a budget. Uh, it sounded really good. But you forget that the legislature gets to make the rules. And I can tell you, I served four years, or four, of my six years in the assembly, four of those years I was vice chair of budget. So I served on all the conference committees, all the budget committees during my, those four years. It was the budget lead in the assembly. And I can tell you that in, I, I was budget vice chair when it, we, we, when it was the latest budget in history. I think we went to September. And I can remember people saying, you're not doing your job. You're not doing your job. Pass a budget. And I would say, no, I'm doing my job. Because the worst thing we could do is pass a bad budget. And so I think that's one of the issues that we end up having to figure out is sometimes, sometimes I felt like the public was told, if you get a budget on time, that's the goal of the legislature. No. It should be efficient, effective spending is the goal of the legislature. Not getting a budget done on time, especially when you get to make the rules. And you get to like make believe money may come from the federal government. Or you get to like make believe that a, budget, uh, 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 a uh, tax increase is gonna pass. So those are the kind of crazy things that I think sometimes, you know, sometimes I think those who, the strategists out there fool us thinking that this is a really good idea, this will get them. When indeed, they figured it all out from the beginning. Yeah. yeah uh, <clears throat> I am a retired fire protection engineer, uh, retired about 12 years ago, so I might not be completely up to date in, as far as all the laws go. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to respond to some of the comments that were made tonight. 
the most recent one of which was the guy whose house was on fire and the fire department turned around. Well, the reason they did that is not because of a revenge against the guy, it's because they can only respond if they are requested by that fire chief in the other district to come and give mutual aid. And that's a state law. Yeah. Okay. That mutual aid would have been then required then if, it was a, if they were in the state responsibility to, area. It has that to would be have been a CAL FIRE request. Yeah, it has to be a request. Right. Uh, there was a gentleman who said that uh, a fire department would light backfires and not necessarily respond to the house fire. The reason they light backfires is that's an area where they can protect against and they don't have a fire coming at them from all directions. So if they could do a controlled backfire burn, they can do a better job of protecting the structures behind them. And allow me to say that when your house is on fire, the fire department does not, as I re understand 12 years ago, does not, is not required by law to put out your fire. They are required by law to make sure your fire does not become somebody else's fire. Right. You can't spread beyond your property. If you're one of three houses and your house is burning and two houses are exposed, the fire department is going to work on the exposed houses before they work on your house. And I believe that's a state law. Let me comment on this uh, fee, mm -hmm. tax, whatever we want right. to call it. Uh, what hasn't been mentioned tonight is the 100-foot rule requirement, a law of the state of California that if you live in a fire hazard brush area, you have to maintain 100 feet clear of hazardous combustible flammable vegetation from around your property, from around your house. Uh, I believe, I could be wrong, that the majority of the fees here, taxes, are intended to help the fire prevention people enforce that law. No, it, 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 no there's no new programs being backfilled. Okay. So this is... It, all, all the fee does is backfill the programs that are already in place. So, okay. it, me... in place is enforcement of defensible space. Okay. So, yes, this money goes to the enforcement of defensible space, but that's because the general fund used the money that used to do that to help pay for general fund expenses. Okay. Allow me to add that... I have six acres in a brush hazard area, and I keep it very clear. I spend more, a lot more than $150 a year to clear that property. Right. Uh, I have never seen a fire inspector come and verify that I've done this. They've, they've done to my neighbors. Uh, in fact, one neighbor had three fire inspectors come out at the same time to enforce it. They'd only need one. I don't know why they've got three. Uh, so I would hope that this money is going to that sort of enforcement, but it's not. That's sad it's, to hear. It's going to backfill the programs that are already in place. Okay. No new programs. All right. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, I live in Cottonwood, and Cottonwood is unincorporated, but we are covered by the Cottonwood uh, Fire District. Yes. Are we going to get a bill? Um, the answer is maybe. <laughs> Even though we have a fire department, uh, fire hydrant right next to our house. Here's here's what will and, and and again, this is where it gets kind of interesting and in why it is that you need to. If you get the bill, you need to start trying to figure out where you are. Okay. If you have a self-imposed fire district, they I the theoretically they are going to discount your hundred and fifty dollars by thirty five dollars. <laughs> Okay. The rationale that I've heard for that is because your district is paid for fire suppression. This fee is for fire prevention. And your fire, they'll say your special fire district doesn't pay for prevention, it just puts fires out. That will be the rationale. So I, I, I believe that you will get a bill. I believe it'll be for $115. And I think you ought to protest that bill. Yeah. Pay it and protest it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Carl Stone. I'm a retired operating engineer. <clears throat> I'm also a miner. I don't know if you folks are aware of what they just did to the miners in the state of California, but... 
they just about ruined us. The, before that, they ruined the logging industry. Now they're out to get everybody. This is just another boondoggle for them to get more money for themselves because they're running out of money. It's bunk. No, I'm gonna, I want to speak my mind, and, I, and it won't be long. <laughs> I joined a tea party because I believed in what the tea party does. They threw the tea overboard when they couldn't stand a king taxing them anymore. I haven't heard anybody mention yet how the heck we're going to throw the tea overboard. <laughs> it's time for us to stand up and say, no, we're not going to give them any more money. Hey. Years ago, when we lived in the Bay Area, we used to drive up I-99 a lot to this area to visit relatives. And as you looked off to the east, all you saw were these beautiful mountains with these strips running up periodically. Fire breaks. They used to be all over the California mountains so that fires that were the, the, that lightning started, as most of our wildfires right. are, right. did not go beyond a certain range of area. Now, if they are going to collect extra money for prevention, <laughs> are they going to rebuild those fire breaks? You know, I don't know the answer if fire breaks and that work is, well, first of all, I can't start here. No new programs or fire breaks will be built as a result of this fee. Okay? Now, as to whether if part of this fee is going to go back to reimburse for some of those things, I don't know the exact answer to that. But I can tell you, we'll not see new fire breaks or those programs as a result of this fee. Okay, I think we're done. I think we've exhausted the one last question from the back of the room, but you don't have a mic. <sighs> CRV. Go ahead. Cap it off on CRV. I'll tell you. You want to go from you want to go from the fire to the fi frying pan here on that one. I'll tell you. CRV. It it frosts me too. Let me tell you. And here's the sad thing about it, and that is, so the state of California, you know, has the CRV fund. The CRV they collect that money. And it's supposed to then to help run the, re, you know, the, the recycling systems, right, that are, you see in the parking lots and all these other things. And then what the state of California does, it goes in there and borrows the money. Borrows the money, <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden they don't have enough money to pay those contractors out there who have been running these programs, who bid their base, these programs based upon these funds coming to them. So what happens? They run a bill in the legislature to increase the CRV. It is a, it is a, it is a, a way around a tax increase. Because they can increase the CRV with a simple majority vote bill. But the money that was already collected for the CRV wasn't for the recycling program. It went to the general fund. So, now, you, no, certainly not anything to make us happy about, but that's unfortunately the way it is. That's why I tell people, don't give them any more money when it comes to the issue of those tax issues that are on the ballot. Don't do it. No matter how drastic and the story is, just don't do it. Now, let me make it clear again, if you get a bill from the state, I like this fire fee, I always recommend pay it. Protest it and pay it. Because the problem is the pain down the line, if you try to not, isn't worth the effort. It may make you feel good at the moment, but I'm afraid that down the line, three or four years when that bill now is 10 times that amount, it's more problematic. So pay it and protest it, but when you have a choice, don't pay. <laughs>